Somebody asked me, I've had several people ask me what series I was preaching um, now, and I guess the truth is I'm not doing a series, but what I am doing the last two Sundays, there's a thing called the lectionary, and it's a structured way, it's a three-year structure, uh, a way of going through Scripture, going through the Bible. And so the last two Sundays, I've used the lectionary reading, and today I've chosen that lectionary reading out of the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. And I don't know that I've ever preached on this before. Uh, and so this will be an adventure for all of us. I mean, I've read it a bunch of times, and it's not an unfamiliar passage, but we want to kind of see what it has to say for us. And one of the things that I think is true um, is a lot of the old terms for our lives in Christ have kind of gotten uh, overused or full of baggage, we might say, and so trying to come up with a new understanding of some of those. That's why uh, in our mission statement as a church, we say that our mission is to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. We could have inserted the word there, disciple, but that word, it's gotten so confusing. What is that? What does that mean? When you say a devoted follower of Jesus, I mean, that pretty well clarifies what a disciple is, doesn't it? <clears throat> Go like this. Um, uh, several years ago, there was a guy that wrote a book. His name was John Purdy, and he was saying the same thing, that the old terms are inadequate, these old metaphors. And, and he, he stuck on this one that I kind of like, hearers of the call, hearers of the call. And the truth is that every one of us who are sitting here, unless you came for the, the Bacchus uh, baptism, uh, you're probably here because at some point in your life as a follower of Jesus, as you heard God calling, you heard a knock, and I don't know how that came to you, but and it comes to each one of us differently, as you heard this call, and we are hearers of that call of God that calls us into this relationship. Now, we're a Methodist church. We come out of a tradition called the Wesleyan tradition, and in our tradition, we have a way of looking at the grace of God. There's only one grace of God but we kind of look at it in parts, and we talk about this thing called prevenient grace. It's an old word we don't use much anymore, and we get the word prevent, uh, the current word, prevent from that old word, and it's an action that goes before something, and prevenient grace is that call of God, that knock of God that goes before our saying yes. But once we understand that God is calling us, and we're hearers, and we say yes we're on the path. Hearing the call of God is a summons to belief and action. And it's one of the keys of being a disciple. Purdy, the guy that wrote that book, talked about an experience he had when he was a little kid. He said he'd be out in the yard playing with his neighbor friends and they'd be playing hide and seek. And in the midst of their play, as they were playing hide and seek, he would hear something it was his mother's voice at the back door, and she would be calling him and saying, it's time to come in. She was calling him to come in. Now, he said, if you were walking by our house and by the yard, you wouldn't know anything different because most of the time when she would call and I would hear, I just kept on playing. But he said it was different because I'd been given the call to come in and everything changed because I knew that my time outside was coming to an end. Hearers of the call. That's what we are when we choose to follow Jesus. And to answer the call a lot of times is a continuous process. It's, you know, for some of us maybe we just answered the call, we never looked back and we just kept going. But for a lot of us, this text that we're reading this morning suggests in this question that Jesus asked the disciples that sometimes we wrestle with things. Have you ever wrestled with God? And Jesus asked this question, do you wish to go away? Now that's a key discipleship question. Do you wish to go away? And to understand the question, you need to understand a little bit of the context. You'd have to go back and read the previous 
60 verses in chapter 6 to understand it. Let me see if I can give you a quick summary. Would that work? That's good. One or two of you responded. I'm going to talk about the rest of you here in a second. It says that when many of his disciples heard, heard it, heard what he was saying, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And so what's he talking about? What's he saying? He's talking about in chapter 6 sort of the context of Jesus asking these discipleship questions. So Jesus had been teaching the followers, all this mass of people, basically who he was. He had fed the multitude. He had taken these five loaves and these two fish, and it said that he, he multiplied that and fed 5,000. It says men there because uh, there are some parts of the Bible that the people that wrote are a little sexist. Uh, I'm, I'm being kidding. Some of the modern translations, we include the women, but they think that there were probably more like 10,000 plus if you count the children in there. So this crowd had followed him, and when, he, when they heard what Jesus was saying about who he was and they saw these miracles, they were confronted with this fact, this reality of following him because they knew who he was. They weren't sure that they bought in on everything about who he was, but the other reality was that they were hungry. Then they got into this discussion about signs. And all those that had been fed who were followers remembered the story in the Old Testament of Moses. And the Israelites had, in the wilderness had gotten this sign. God had provided for them, and God gave them what to eat? Manna from heaven. And they reminded Jesus that Moses had fed the people with this bread from heaven. And Jesus says, look, it wasn't Moses that did this. It was God himself through Moses that provided this. And then they said, they responded, and they said, sir, we want some of this bread. We want to eat this bread always. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. Here's the statement. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then the discussion continued, and it all centered around this image of bread and manna from the wilderness. And Jesus closes the discussion with these words. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate. And what was different? You remember what he said in the text, in the scripture? The ancestors ate the bread that was... God provided through Moses the manna and what happened to them he said they died he said but the one who eats this bread will live forever now the crowd had a tough time with his sayings eat my flesh and drink my blood <clears throat> historically one of the criticism, criticisms against Christianity has been that it's a cannibalistic religion because of the act of communion, and that's another sermon. But they struggled with the reality of what he was saying because they knew that in essence what Jesus was saying is that he was placing a claim on their lives if they were going to choose a life in God that came down from heaven which was in him and with him. If anyone was going to have eternal life, they were going to have to accept Jesus and submit to him. And it was clear that this call of discipleship was difficult. It was a call that demanded that they make Jesus the master over their lives and that they had to, if they were going to make him master of their lives, had to make him, give him a priority in the way they lived. And then it goes on and says this. And this is always interesting to me. <clears throat> the way that John chose to say it because it didn't say that the crowd chose or they chose or the men chose it didn't use any of those words it says some of the 
and it uses this term, some of the disciples turned back and no longer went with him. It's interesting that they use the word disciple, isn't it? And Jesus, as he always did, and he does here, is he took advantage of this situation and he turns now to this inner core of 12. Now let me pause, let me put this on pause a minute and, and do a commercial. Can I do that? I'm going to do it anyway, so you might as well say, yeah, it's okay. Um, coming up in September, the Navigators are having a conference, um, and my old seminary professor, uh, Dr. Robert Coleman, was the Creelus Professor of Evangelism at Asbury Seminary, and he's going to be preaching. Uh, Chapel Hill Methodist Church is going to be sponsoring this. It's toward the end of September, and I'll get you more information. Dr. Coleman wrote a book that has become a classic called The Master Plan of Evangelism, which if you're going to go to the conference, they encourage you to read it. And in the book, he makes an observation of the gospel. And he said, Jesus taught and engaged and ministered to the multitude. And then he took that opportunity and that situation, and he would teach and invest in the twelve. Why do you suppose he did that? So here in this story, he uses the situation. He's been teaching the multitude. Now he focuses on the 12. What do you think he was doing? Somebody said this morning in first service uh, that he was training, which I agree with. I think he was. <clears throat> but what was he trying to teach? What was he trying to train? I think, I think this is one of the things he was doing is he knew why he had come to earth, and that was to give his life as a ransom, to die on the cross as an atonement. And I think he knew that, some, that he had chosen, that God had called these disciples that were following, that once he was gone, he invested in them so that the work of Christ, the mission of Christ, the church, the body of Christ would continue. And I think that still happens is he still calls and uses us. So Jesus, let's come back. Jesus turns to the 12 and he asks them this question. After all this has happened, he asks them this question, do you also wish to turn away? Now, I just want to say that I think the temptation to go away uh, is a reality. Uh, I think we still all wrestle with this temptation to go away. Uh, discipleship dropouts. I mean, we think that we accept Christ and it's a done deal, but we still wrestle with things, don't we? Bev and I went through a, a phase in eight, 1984 where our relationship was on the rocks and, uh, <clears throat> and I just didn't think we were going to survive. And I thought, I, I'm emotionally and spiritually bankrupt. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning. He said, I just got to that point emotionally. I couldn't. I had to take a few days off. I, and that's where kind of we were in our relationship. And at that very moment, God opened a door, and I left the ministry. Went to work for a health care company. Uh, and I was angry at God. Uh, this, this, this discipleship dropout happens to us in the course of life. It happens to us practically in the church. Some people come to New Covenant, and they say, well, it's too big. This church is too big. And some others come, they say, well, it's too small. Some people come to New Covenant, and they say, well, it's too involved in, in stuff outside the church and social kinds of things or drilling water wells. Other people say, well, it's not involved enough. Some people I've talked to, when I tell them where the church is and I invite them to come, they say, well, I don't want to go there. That's Edmund. And they think that we're kind of snobs that live up here. They just haven't been up here. They don't know how good of people we are, do they? Most of you answered. That's good. Some people come, and if I mention, you know, some things, like if I happen to mention money in a sermon, somebody will call me. I've got people that call me and say, you know, if I just, I, I talk, I preach about money maybe twice a year in, in a sermon. And maybe, you know, Jesus talked about money about three-thirds of the time. 
And so I, t- I mentioned money, and somebody called me and said, you're talking too much about money. It's all you all think about is money. And, and all I'm saying is, if you're looking for excuse, and there's a jillion more, there's always a temptation to drop out. There's always, and sometimes there's legitimate reasons. We, there are two big reasons, I think, that, that I think people are tempted to drop out. One, I think, has to do with the unique claims of Jesus. I think when we look at Jesus as the bread of life, the source of any meaning and understanding, is, and we understand who Jesus is and what he did is that we struggle and we come to passages like in the Gospel of John where it says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by and through him as we struggle. Well, what about the Muslims? What about the Buddhists? What about these other religions? And we struggle with the unique claims of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And what he demands of us, and I think the reason we struggle, and maybe this is a generalization, I apologize for this generalization, okay, is because there is a sense that all of us have dumbed down, we've dumbed down the Christian, the Christian faith to make it easy so that we're not uncomfortable, right? Usually when we come to church, <clears throat> We ask the question, and this is okay, we ask the question, what can I get if I come? Discipleship, when we consider this journey of becoming a devoted follower of Jesus, brings us to this place where the question is not what I can get, but God, how can you use me? What can I give? And so the uniqueness of Jesus is a big issue, and the, and the second one is, is a crowd mentality is you know, I can tell you, I can trend this out on a chart, the years I've been at New Covenant, I can tell you when we have groups of people that have left. The last group, the last big group we had leave, you may tell you when it was? Anybody interested? Hello? We were raising money to build the children's building, and we needed to raise three or so million dollars, and so we were making a plea. Above your tithe, above your giving, we need you to make a sacrificial giving, not, not uh, equal sacrifice, not equal amounts. And we had about 40 or so people leave. I don't know why they left. They didn't have to give anything. You know, some chose not to and stayed. But they felt uncomfortable. They left. And so when it's crowd started, they left. So crowd mentality. So let's move on. So Jesus presses the question, do you also want to go away? And that brings us to Peter's response. Peter replied, Lord... To whom should we go? Who could we go to? You have the words. You're the only one. You have the words of eternal life. One commentator said, I can imagine that tears got in Peter's eyes as he shifted nervously from one foot to the other. Stark terror struck deep in his heart, the kind that he never experienced before, and his soul went cold with fear as he spoke his mind, the mind of all the other eleven, Lord Whom should we go to? Only you have the words of eternal life. And what this leads us to is the second thing, is discipleship, being a devoted follower, takes determination. A friend of mine uh, who's retired now, uh, who's been a mentor to a lot of us, Norman Neves, he pastored here in Oklahoma City at Servant, and he got a letter from one of his, one of a lady in his church, a parishioner, who wrote this letter in the in the small hours of the morning. She couldn't sleep. She was upset, and so she wrote out her feelings. And she said, "This. <clears throat> what stage of grief is this? Or is it grief at all? Just when I experience a little consistency in my new life alone, the next rug I step on is pulled out from under me." Is this all a part of adjusting, or am I being humbled for some greater purpose? My faith is not strong enough to stand on. Any of you all ever felt that way? But my instinct to survive this lonely stretch of my life is so compelling that I am able to leave the security of my past 
and go on. Why do my thoughts wake me up at night, screaming out for paper and pen? There are so few answers I've found. It would be nice to have the comfort back, but not at the expense of my very own soul. So what can I do? Well, I think I will continue to feel, now listen to this, I think I will continue to feel my way back through the darkness, feeding my faith until someday the light comes on again. Wow. <clears throat> That's determination, isn't it? Even when things are not figured out and it's not all put together and it's not clear and there's confusion and it seems like there's darkness, this woman chose to feel her way forward in the darkness by feeding her faith. And that brings me to the last point. Our determination has to be fed by the discipline of being a follower. <clears throat> There's this tendency when we get threatened and we feel this sense of, of threat, of our security, that we go into what psychologists call a selectively we become selectively inattentive. And there may be times where that's legitimate, but I'm going to say in discipleship that it's the opposite, that what we need to have is selective attention, attentiveness to our walk with Christ. This morning uh, in the first service, Jay did the same announcements he did in our service and did such a great job. Then he'd do a great job. Where is he? Where is he? There he is. Um, and he talked about that he's having a hard time getting focused on football starting up. Uh, he's looking forward to basketball. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of talk about the Thunder. You remember, you know their first game's coming up October when? 28th against San Antonio Spurs. And so there's a lot of talk about f not only football right now, but also basketball. I was reading a story this week. I'm going to close with this one about the best coaches in the game. <clears throat> and uh, Mike Krzyzewski came up, Coach K. And let me just tell you, let me just share some of this story with you. He went to Duke, which is, by the way, a Methodist school, in 1980. And they were so bad, by the third year he was there, they were so bad that the crowd, the home crowd, were booing them in their own field house. In March 11, 1983, the Blue Devils suffered the worst defeat in the school's history, 109-66, to a loss to Virginia. And at the hotel, the alumni and fans sort of shrank back from Coach K when he walked into the lobby of the hotel like he had a disease. That night, they sat down together, all the coaches, the assistant coaches, and one of the assistant coaches suggested that what they needed to do was recruit new players. And Coach K said, absolutely not. Then he pushed forward a sheet of paper across the table with five names on it. Four of them were flesh, freshman players from that night's debacle. And he said, this will be our squad next year. Losing doesn't make us a loser unless you think you're a loser. I'm not quitting on these kids, Coach K said. One of the assistant coaches offered a toast. Here's to forgetting tonight ever happened. Coach K lifted his tea glass, looked around the table, and he held his glass up and he said, here's to never forgetting what happened. Those battered freshmen that year went on to have one of the best records in NCAA history, 37 wins, and lost that year the national championship by three points. Since then, they've had 12 times in the final four, and they've won the national championship five times, including when most recently? Where's my basketball fans? Last year, Duke Blue Devils won the national championship, and Coach K said the key has always been discipline. Never forgetting 
a defeat, he says, because that's the key to victory. Those places where we struggle, the scripture lesson, the, the watchword I read to you a few moments ago, what does it say about weakness? Christ is our strength, and even when we're weak, we're what? We're strong. Peter knew that. And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. One of the things, my nephew became a follower of Jesus this summer, a Carl. And so we started using the U verse, U version. Is it U version or U verse? What is it, Jay? U version. And we started with one of those reading. There's a jillion reading plans. And we read the Gospel of John. Then we read the Gospel of Matthew. And I just finished last week. Uh, first and second uh, Peter, and now I've started on the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, some of those, and just reading in a disciplined way. And what I'm saying, when we engage ourselves as followers of Jesus and the disciplines of Christ, prayer, Bible study, worship, witnessing, good stewardship habits, meaningful conversation with Christian friends, when we engage ourselves in those disciplines and we become selectively attentive even when it's uncomfortable, we allow space for God and the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives. In 2002, the Blue Devils were passed by a conference rival in one of their games. Coach K was quiet on this long trek on the bus back to Durham. They arrived at 7 p.m. that night. That was a three-hour bus ride. Everybody was exhausted. The team filed off the bus thinking they were going to the dorm room, and Coach K said, not so fast. He said, I want everybody dressed and on the court in 10 minutes. Gentlemen, we're going to practice. And the story said that it was the toughest practice of that year, and Coach K said it wasn't punishment. It was an opportunity that loss reminds us that we have to work hard to win. I want to drill that message into the team while the defeat was fresh on their minds. Determination and discipline, he said. Now here's my final question. I mean, this is a college basketball team. They're not going to ch change the world, right? At least I, maybe I'm underselling them. I don't think they are. But here's what I'm saying. If we look at the lesson and we choose to use the same determination and discipline as followers of Jesus, what could happen? What could happen in us? And what if a group of us, and, and I'm not saying we don't, but what if we focused determination and discipline as a church what could happen in our community? What could happen in the kingdom of God? That's the discipleship question. Our response, determination and discipline, will assure a redemptive process. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen.